Hey friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Awesome to have you here. In today's episode, we have music producer Michael Beinhorn, and he has done records for artists such as Red Hot Chili Peppers, Marlon Manson, Soundgarden, Herbie Hancock, and many others. Michael is a very passionate man, and this interview took quite a different path than I expected. And we ended up talking quite a lot about everything that's wrong with the music business and record labels, why artists need to continue to innovate to push music further. And we also spoke about why we need to demand more excellence in music and art, and why Michael is still mad are we referring to the Beatles as something to inspire for or something to be like. This is something Michael is very passionate about, and I found his ideas and viewpoints very interesting, and I'd love to know what you think, so feel free to leave a comment as we go through the interview. I'd love to hear if you agree or disagree with what Michael is saying. But before we get into the interview with Michael, I'd love for you to first, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the podcast, whether that's on Apple Podcasts or here on YouTube. Uh, also, feel free to leave a comment, uh, let me know what you think. I would also love if you join the email list. And if you do so, you get exclusive access to interviews before anyone else. You also get a chance to submit questions to up and coming guests on the show. Uh, so just click the link in the description below. Enter your email address and you're on the list and you get exclusive access. Uh, but that's it. Let's get into the interview with Michael Beinhorn. Awesome, Michael. Um, well, yeah, I don't have really an intro for the podcast or the show, whatever we call it. Uh, it's a bit okay. rough. It's a bit rough around uh, rough around the edges. Um, That's okay. But thank you for taking your time and thank you for coming on. I've been looking forward My to pleasure. it. My pleasure. Awesome. Uh, so I actually want to start this interview. I was listening to your first band, I guess it is, um, Material, obviously, uh, and your record Memory Serves. And there's this is track on it uh, called Upriver. And uh -huh. I first heard it today and it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> there's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something with the guitar. Uh, I don't know what he did to his guitar, but it sounds like there's a major fret buzz. I mean, it's obviously intentional, I guess. Uh, what's uh, your memory from from doing that record? And you were so young from too. From memory serves, right? Yeah, the twenty one. Um, yeah, I think that that was actually a uh, Fender Six, um, a baritone guitar. Ah. With um, and he was using a, I think he was using a slide on that, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, makes sense. So th that would explain why the, why it's real buzzy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my memory from it's you know to tell you the truth, my memories from that are pretty sporadic. Yeah. Um, you know, we had gotten a bit of money from our record company, Electro Musician, which is a big deal to us back then. Um. But we uh, we we kind of you know we 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 sort of saw saw material as a collective and we just kind of tried to get as many cool people to work with us as possible and it kind of it made the it, it was kind of cheating in a way <laughs> but it made the end result like that much better I, if it had been if it had just been like the you know the three of us at that time I think that uh, it you know it, it just it wouldn't have been that great. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> You but, know. I mean, it's it's crazy that you were so young when you guys did that stuff. Uh, I mean, did, how old were you when you started in the band? It was like 17 or something? 18. 18, right. Yeah. Yeah. Pr I mean, pretty much. Pretty much around around that general time period. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, look, there, there are people who are, success who are incredibly successful now who are like 17, 18 years old. Sure. So, but like, they didn't play the same music, though, you know. Ah uh, no, they didn't. They definitely, did. they definitely did not. And there, there aren't very many people doing that kind of thing now either. Exactly. It was, it was really nice to hear it. I mean, it was fresh, you know. It was just to something new, and I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate coming across that music. So, uh, well, really I'm cool. glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, because your job was synthesizer, right? But that was your instrument yeah. of choice. It was, it was my instrument because I was such a bad keyboard player. Hmm. <laughs> Um, and I, fortunately I, I, I knew how to program a synthesizer, which is, which is something that not a lot of people could do. 
Right. So it sort of gave me, it, it, it sort of gave me an inside track. Um, but I have to say musically, a lot of the time I was sort of flying blind. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> and all kind right. of like, it was kind of, I think it was kind of like a blind person trying to read, you know, without braille. I was just sort of like, uh, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, that fits that, that music to be honest, you know, um, it does. It, it, it fit, it fit well. You know, I, I think I, I also had a good sense of what sounded, what, 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 what worked well sonically, hmm. which is why I, I, I enjoyed programming synth so much. Yeah. Uh, did you have a modular synth or what was the synth you get into? Um, the first synth I had was a micro Moog, right. um, uh, one of those tiny little monophonic ones. Hmm. And um, I, I, you know, I, I sort of taught myself how to program. And then when I was a little bit older, I found a place in the city where they taught, where they actually gave you hands on lessons with like Buchla series, two, 200, 200 series right. systems. And I was in heaven. You know, I, I'd always wanted to be around one of these things and I was able to use it and fiddle around with it for hours. And it was just so much fun. And that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much how I learned to do all that. Cool, man. I mean, because I recently uh, got into modular synthesis uh, and it's, it's really fun. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's addicting, addict, add, addicting, addictive. Yeah. Very addictive. Both. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, it feels like such a perfect instrument for an engineer, I guess, or, you know, someone who wants to become an engineer because it's a lot of thinking before you can do something, right? There is, yeah. Um, and you actually don't need to know a whole lot to make to make it sound to, to make it do something interesting. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think when I knew less, I was actually I was able to make cooler yeah, cooler yeah. sounds. <laughs> I sort of didn't know what I was. I didn't really know what I was doing. Exactly, <laughs> I just went man. for something like, "What does this do?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's always when you do the best stuff, I guess. Um, yeah. But so what got you into synthesis in the beginning? You said you wanted to play keyboard, but that didn't happen. No, when I was when I was about uh, when I was little, I just became fascinated with sounds. And then uh, my my grandparents had uh, one of um, Wendy Carlos's switched on Bach records, and I remember hearing that. It just put me into a whole different like frame of consciousness. Like it really blew my mind. And I was like six or seven at the time. And I just thought to myself, my God, you know, and then I saw what these instruments look like. And I was like, oh, my God, look at all the knobs and the cables. And there's a keyboard like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was like that was my dream then for, you know, for for years and years until I finally got my first synthesizer. Nice. Man. You know, to have something that could make sounds like that, that could make all kinds of sound, otherworldly sounds, sounds that sounded like acoustic instruments. Sounds that sounded like pure noise. Hmm. It you know like the, it was it was like a universe of possibilities. Right. Was that something your parents were playing at home, or where did you discover <laughs> the music? Uh, well, as I said, my grandparents had that right. album. I mean, right. my parents were pretty much bog standard. Like they liked the, they liked classical music. We weren't really allowed to listen to too much rock. Like my, my parents, they they sort of drew the line at the Beatles. Like the Beatles were fine with them. Anything else was like, nah. Like we actually wound up with a Kinks record and a Who record at one point, and that was about it. Like nothing outside the Beatles was really like it was all verboten. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what, what were their thoughts when when you did all those rock records later on? Um, I think that they were really nervous. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, because because I did exactly what um, I think most parents of that era would didn't want their kids to do and that's become an artist right you know that wasn't that wasn't the thing that you let your kids do and if you did it like oh boy you're in for a world of, of pain and you know your life is going to suck and you're going to die starving in a garret someplace you know with tuberculosis yeah <laughs> uh, you know the old the, the, the old stereotype right and, you know they were they were concerned because i it didn't it didn't look like it was generating any livelihood but you know, when you're like 19, 20, 21, you're kind of like livelihood, you yeah, know, exactly. all I know is I got enough money to go to the corner store, buy myself like a, 
you know, a, a turkey hero and a, and, a, and a can of Coke, you know, and a bag of chips, and I'm good to go for the rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's how that, that's how it was, you know. I mean, that was a yeah. good time with being young, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically built to withstand anything. Yeah. Like, your body can take... <laughs> Your body can take anything that you and anyone else throws at it, um, and you're just you're you're like battle worthy. You know, mm -hmm. the only thing that can stop you is really whatever's neuro whatever neurosis is going on in your head. Yeah. And you know, like most kids, I had plenty of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you just kind of you just you just forge ahead anyway. Yeah. You know. Exactly, man. That that's the that's the beauty of youth, I guess. <laughs> It's um, yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time to learn and experience and do stuff. Exactly, man. Um, but when you when you were in the in the band material, um, what was the experience like? Because that was in New York City, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. but what was the what was it like being a young <laughs> musician in New York City at that time, late seventies? Oh, I guess. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say to you is that that is a time that will never, ever be recreated. It's one of the most important uh, periods in cultural, in Western cultural history, in my opinion. Right. It was amazing. Um, it was. The, it, it, New York was a cesspool. It was just a filthy, horrible place. Like economically, it was still falling apart. You know, it was just a, it was a mess. There was such wealth, inequity and disparity. You know, you could go up to, you know, the, the East 60s and, you know, see where people lived in these gorgeous penthouses and their apartments along, you know, Fifth Avenue and on, on the West Side. And then you go downtown and you didn't even know what if you turned a certain street corner, if you come out the other end of it alive, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, or if you went down 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue, you were literally taking your life in your own hands. You didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, it was, it, you know, it, it was basically like being in a movie. It was insane. and it, But it was real. Every single day was real. Um, and it, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a melting pot. Like people are coming from all over the world who are artists, musicians, you know, to kind of like pick, soak up that vibe. Yeah. Um, there was nothing like it anywhere, anywhere in the world. It was extraordinary. Like I'd go outside and I'd run into people I knew, you know, I'd see like, I'd see guys like Ornette Coleman walking down the street and stuff like that. You know, it was, you know, you didn't know who you were going to run into. You didn't know who, you know, whose house you were going to be at in the evening, right, right. you know, who you'd be jamming with, like, you know, where you'd be eating dinner like right. you could be in like someone's loft in the evening watching a bunch of guys, you know, who you looked up to playing jazz in, in someone's living room. Wow. You know, I mean, th there would be loft parties all the time. People leave their doors open. You just kind of walk in off the street and kind of sit down, you know, and watch these like amazing jazz musicians just jam. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, there were performance spaces everywhere. There was a place called The Kitchen, which I'm pretty sure does not exist anymore, you know where there were jazz performances, dance performances, um, performance art, you know, some of the most famous performance art um, work of all time. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I saw the Beastie Boys perform there. Cool. Uh, when Robert Fripp came to New York, he did his first Frippertronics performance in, the, in, in that performance space. Right. You know, it, it was just jumping, absolutely jumping. It was just, it was fertile and everyone had an attitude and <laughs> everyone was trying to outdo everyone else you know my shit's gonna knock your shit down yeah, and yeah. you know <laughs> but it was i mean that kind of competition is great like you don't really see that now it's kind of like oh you know my new album dropped it's like my new album dropped okay yeah. you know what's that compared to no my shit's gonna fuck your shit up you know right like i and you know frankly i miss that you know i i miss that sense of like um there was camaraderie, and at the same time, there was the the competition was intense. Yeah, you know, and everyone was look, walking around trying to look cooler than the other guy, you know. But you know, you were rubbing shoulders with guys like Jean Michel Basquet, and you know, right, right. Uh, it was and Keith Haring. It was just an amazing time, and hip hop was kind of hitting, right, as well. And you know, we'd go to places like the Roxy and watch people from like. 
Brooklyn and the Bronx kind of do hip hop battles and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and beatbox performances and scratching performances. It was just, you know, I, it, we'll never we'll never see anything like that again. It was it, I couldn't have been I couldn't have been more blessed right. actually. I mean, yeah, it it sounds awesome for someone like me who never, I wasn't born then, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> you know, it's always because I was asking. Um, uh, I had an interview yesterday with uh, Lee Sklar, a bass player. Um, oh yeah, That's great. Yeah, and we, I was talking, asking this almost the same question about you know how people like me romanticize the '60s and '70s in LA, right? The music scene. Uh, he said it was better than we think it was oh, you yeah. know uh, oh yeah there's it sounds no like way your experience it, was the same oh th there's we can only mythologize it at this point yeah but there's no way to crank it up and to amp it up to the level that really comes close you know th that brings it close to what it really was like yeah exactly it was incredible yeah i can, I can only imagine man uh, you can only imagine yeah unfortunately that's all that's all you're gonna get yeah and go but it's, back it's to up the to you know it's up to people now to try and like cre to create that same thing you know it's 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 doable it's just a matter of what you're you know how much you're willing to to, to commit mm -hmm. exactly um but what do you think new york changed then? like was it mid 80s or 90s um it, you know i mean i i think the whole downtown scene as as happens with everything hmm. start to get commercialized you know when people when people with money see that they can make money hmm. off something like in generally an art scene that that's happening what they do is they try and co-opt it it becomes like the cool place to hang out when it's the cool place to hang out people want to live there so what do you do you purchase real estate there right. you start gentrifying an area you know, you make it safer so that people who aren't artists can move in. And that's where you lose everything where like the soul just kind of like evaporates. Right. You know, I mean, gradually it's been that's been happening to the Lower East Side. You can't get the funk out of there completely. Right. right. Um, they've definitely been people have definitely been able to, um, I guess, sanitize it considerably from what it was. Because, you know, I mean, it was it was also kind of scary being down there like you. <laughs> If you went below Avenue B, you know, for, for me, Avenue A to Avenue B was like, okay, you're all right. right. Once you got below Avenue B, though, you were t you knew that you were taking your own life in your hands. Right. <laughs> there, you know, gangs, drug dealers. I mean, you you basically knew that there was a chance you'd be walking out of there. You'd be leaving their feet first. Right. You know, right. in an ambulance or with a with a with a blanket over your head. Wow. No, it was it was really scary. Yeah. It was really scary. You know, you, you you just but you just knew that you just had to. You know, you just you just had to know, mm -hmm. or you were an idiot. You were an idiot. And something bad would happen. Yeah, exactly, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I think it's the same thing happening to London for a long time. You know, where it gets more expensive, it drives people out, um, and stuff like that. That always happens, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, gentrification is a process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's you know, it's it it took place actually in the last neighborhood, or one of the last neighborhoods in Los Angeles that I lived in, which is the Arts District. Right. Um, which was basically called it was called the Arts District because artists lived down there. Yeah. You know, but all of a sudden investors started coming in and going like, hmm, and then they started putting stores in there. There were high end like clothing stores and stuff like that. One of which closed shortly after my wife and I moved there because they weren't able to generate any interest because they were still artists down there, people who can't afford their expensive clothes. But they put a brewery in right. and the brewery started <laughs> hopping. It always and then starts they put the another brewery <laughs> in and the brewery was across the street from where I was living. Yeah. And that's when the shit began to jump off, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, at that point, everyone's like, the arts district is the destination spot. There are huge lofts everywhere, lots of places to have parties. That was going on. And now the arts district has been completely gentrified. There's a there was a building there that my wife and I used to love, just this great big empty building. It sat vacant for years. Hmm. And it got transformed into a we work space. 
Ah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> the irony of that is that WeWork is in immense financial exactly. trouble right yeah, now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. But, man. you know, it, yeah, I mean, Warner, Warner Music moved their headquarters from wow. Burbank, California, to the Arts District. Wow. That's how, that's how, like, yeah. And I mean, having Warner Music in there alone is going to, is going to jumpstart the neighborhood because they haven't been able to get anyone to buy into these, like, expensive places. But, I, I mean, I actually looked at a space to put a studio in hmm. at one point, and they were charging, like, $18 a square foot or something like that. Right. You know, uh, if, if, so if you're looking at a 4,000 square foot place, mm. <laughs> you know, you're, it, you're looking at like, actually, in this case, they kind of lowered the price they were kind to us. They offered us the place for $18,000 a month. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's and we were crazy. like, ah. yeah, that's, I mean, in answer to your question, yeah, yeah. gentrification is the thing that like kills I, I'd say it's the thing that kills all the great art scenes. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Especially definitely. the contemporary ones. Exactly. You know, man. like, because it's all about, we want to live where the cool people are, you know? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the cool people are the ones who actually can't afford the high rent. So once you bring in the people who can't afford the high rent and bump all the artists out, place isn't cool anymore. But, yeah, eh, you know, the arts district is definitely not the arts district anymore. Right. That's a shame. Uh, yeah. Actually. They go someplace else. Yeah, exactly. You can never stop the art itself, which is a good thing. Um, it is a good thing. People will always need to express themselves in one way or another. Exactly. Um, you mentioned quickly um, how or the difference in releasing a record back then compared to these days. Um, is there anything else you've seen that you feel is missing? Like in terms of attitude in, in releasing your music or just, yeah, in the music in, scene in general, I guess these days you mean in, in 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 terms of popular music uh i guess popular music yeah it could be any music to be honest uh, because what you said people usually just today say oh i dropped my album it's not the same fight maybe as it was back then uh yeah i mean it, it's definitely more casual um I, I I feel that people are really approaching music creation from a much different perspective that they you know they did, I guess back when I was making records with material and uh, even after that when I was producing artists mm. outright. Yeah. Um. I I I don't I don't feel that people invest themselves in the same way in in making music or recording. And I think that impacts really negatively on the quality um, and the emotional impact, as well as the ability to communicate an idea or a feeling to other people. Uh, I, I, I feel that, that the vast majority of the music that's being made today really doesn't have any kind of traction hmm. because of that. Like, it won't stick with you. It's not sticky, but, you know, the same way, you know, a record that you might like that, that would have been done I don't know, however many years ago, is going to stay with you. Exactly. It's, very, it, it's very temporary. Um, people blame that on, you know, the attention span of children today. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, they say it's the, it, it has to do more with technology, which, I, I mean, honestly, I think that's a crock of horse shit. It's a, it's a, it's a very poor excuse, exactly. and it's also not logical. Uh, you know, because the same people say, oh, you know, kids are no different today than they were like, you know, 100 years ago. Everyone's like rebelling, doing the same thing. You know, that's why you don't that's why they like their music and you don't like it. You're just an old guy. And it's kind of like, eh, that's that whole argument doesn't really hold any kind of water. You know, I mean, right. you have to take a look. That's a, That's a very sort of like general generalized perspective, you know, taken from a very sort of. um I guess a non-participatory kind of um, point of view, uh, because it, it really kind of it, it implies that we don't have to take responsibility for what we put out there. Right, right. You know that people just like what the, the kids like what they like. They're naturally going to be rebellious, you know. But at the same time, they're saying, "Oh, kids today, you know, kids today are, are you know, they're, they're, they don't have any attention span anymore." It's kind of like, okay, make up your mind. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Is it kids today or kids always? Because it can't be both. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's kids today, 
then you can't use the <laughs> you, you you can't use that other argument that like they 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 rebel they they cyclically rebel. I mean, we know that kids are going to are are, are going to go for what they go for, but at the same time, kids are also being advertised to. Sure. And they're also being they're they're also being propagandized to. And this has been been documented everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a terrible problem, and it's a social issue, and it's one that is impacting on today's youth tremendously. You know, exactly. people don't want to take responsibility for this, though. You know, they say, oh. You know, they blame it on the kids. It's like, no, it's not because of the kids. It's because of the fucking people who are advertising shit to them and recognize. I hope I'm allowed to curse on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead, man. <laughs> That's what kids say. The, the, yeah, I mean, but they're they're not they, their ability to make decisions for themselves are taken away for, by people who are trying to sell them stuff. Right. We're trying to sell them attractive like new phones and you know this thing and right, that right. thing, you know, and it all kind of keeps your brain. You know, you're not focusing on anything that keeps you separate from your emotional states and how you and, and kind of getting in touch with how you really feel. And that's one of the things that music has always been best at. It's always been best at centering you, bringing you back to a place in yourself where you're aware of your own feelings, mm-hmm. not only mentally, but from a somatic perspective, like how it feels in your body, you know, uh, and music now is being made with less of that in mind, with more of an eye on impermanence. Yeah, yeah. Things are, are done more. Music is more genre based now. It's a lot less artist based. Right. You know, if you like a particular music, you're, you're as, the, the genre matters to you as much as if not more than the artist does. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Whereas back in, you know, back in the 70s, let's say, you could get three people each of whom liked a different rock band, let's say Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath. And if they did, you know, if you got them in a room together, eventually they would start hitting each other over that. Like they get into fist fights over that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, They're yeah. all rock bands. Yeah, They're yeah, all yeah, totally. rock bands, but they all did something completely different. Mm-hmm. And people would get passionate about this stuff. Yeah. So within a genre, you could find three different artists that did something completely different, affected different people, had a different audience. And you'd be willing to get in a fight over that. Exactly. You know, you don't have that kind of thing today. Yeah, you know, totally. absolutely not. You I know, mean, I, I heard a I heard a good quote from you. It was uh, from another interview. You said something. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, but you said something. Uh, it was in regards to the catalog of labels and how the catalog of Nicki Minaj won't even cover the bus fare in the future. And I thought that was really well put. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's des- it's not designed to have any permanence. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It, it wasn't made to have traction. You know, people th- go like, uh, you know, they think, oh, you know, a song's been overexposed. You know, if, you know, over a billion people have, lis- have watched it on YouTube or something like that. And that's the reason why no one's listening to it anymore. No, 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 no. That's not why they're not listening to it anymore. It's because there literally is no traction to it at all. There's nothing that keeps you emotionally riveted to it. Right. When you go back to a piece of music you love, it's not be- just because there were like great sounds and a catchy melody and you like the sound of so-and-so's voice. Bullshit. You know, it's because you connected with something in that piece of music that was emotional. Mm-hmm. It resonated inside of you. And that's why you went back to it. Exactly. I mean, sure. The sound of the voice, the, the song, the melody. The cool sounds, all those could have played a part in that. Mm -hmm. But there's an intrinsic character to this. There's not just like, there's not something that can be die stamped on an assembly line. You know, music is is a communication form. It's a communication art, you know, and that's one thing that people miss. They, they've tried, it's been turned into pure commodity now, Mm -hmm. you know, something that has some kind of substance to it, because if you have, if something is substance, then you can commodify it. Right. You can know its absolute value in a marketplace. Mm-hmm. But in doing that, you miss the point of what it actually is. Right. You've recontextualized it and turned it into something else and lost its basic, its intrinsic character. Yeah. I mean, because I've always been wondering why I'm always drawn to uh, older songs. And I'm older, I mean, before the 2000s, I think. Uh, for some reason, it always resonate more. I mean... And I guess it has to do with what you're saying. Um, you know, it was really good musicians. The songs were usually kick-ass. Uh, 
and they were great players and they played together you know there's something with that whole thing that i feel is missing that's, more and more that's all that's all important yeah yeah but but there has to be an underlying sentiment an idea that's being communicated through the music and that's what you that's the thing that you don't have now right right i mean i love electronics right i'm yeah. a big fan i always have been i love computer music i have no problem with it mm -hmm. you know i mean craft work in, invent practically single handedly invented the usage uh, the you know full on employment of electronics in popular music you know um I am not hearing anyone with that degree of in, in, innovate that that sense of innovation. Like every new Kraftwerk record, you just go, "Oh my God, what are these guys doing next? This is out there." Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the first time I heard Numbers, right? You know, off Computer World, mm -hmm. which basically changed the world. I mean, that one song just kind of, you know, it created like music scenes. It it it, it, it single handedly invented electro you know, electro um, hip hop in New York, um, you know, and I, I remember hearing that and I, I just was listening to it like, this is like, this is, this consciousness is so deep. It's from another planet. It's taking like, you know, just sort of like a basic rock beat, doom, that, doom, doom, that, doom, that, doom. It's not a disco thing anymore. It's something different and attaching these electronic sounds to it in a way that no one had ever done before. I mean, that was at the, that was at the absolute frontier right and these are and this was a mainstream record that came out and millions of people all over the world heard it and it fucked you up i mean <laughs> yeah. you were done after you heard that record you couldn't see things the same way anymore i know i couldn't right you know i mean you know i mean there'd be no soul sonic force i mean basically hip-hop as we know it today would not exist in the same form if it was not for that record Right. You know, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of other factors at play here. Mm -hmm. That's just one thing. But this was innovation in electronic music. Yeah. You know, you don't hear that now. You don't hear that in 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 the pop music that people are making now. They're basically trying to maintain a status quo, which is much different than innovation. Right. You know, <clears throat> people aren't willing to invest themselves the same way in the creative process that they were. So the process is no longer creative. You know, if you're if you're if you're drawn to older songs, it's not just because of all the window dressing. It's not just because people were playing together right. and and writing better, you know, better songs or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. They were communicating an idea and they were trying. They were making an effort. Mm -hmm. They were trying to do something new. They were trying to push boundaries. And that's what you do when you're an artist. You don't maintain status quo. You're willing to go into areas that are scary. Right. You're right. willing to go places where no one else has gone before and that is the polar opposite of what music popular music creation as well as i would say the music business is is based around now it has nothing to do with artistry at all right i mean do you have any suggestions of how to fix the current situation to to get us back to what you just talked about <laughs> if i'm able to say all that shit to you you better believe it um yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's multi multi level, really. I mean, as an artist, if you're an artist, it's time to get back into yourself to hear to hear what your own thoughts are, to understand what it is that you want. Why did you get into doing this in the first place? What motivated you to pick up an instrument, to write songs, to do whatever it is that you do? You know, get back in touch with that feeling, like chase it down. You know, and find out why you're doing this instead of like having a job at a filling station someplace. Right. You know, or, or or flipping burgers or whatever. You know, this is serious stuff. Art is an occupation. It's not just a pastime. Mm -hmm. It's not a hobby. People who make records shouldn't be hobbyists. Right. If they're hobbyists, they should find another hobby because there's enough people out there trying to do it and right. screwing it up for everyone else who, who takes it seriously. Right. You know, so... As an artist, getting back to that sense of why you started to put to kind of almost like do a hard reset and put yourself at the beginning of the track again and go like, OK, what am I really trying to do here? Instead of see, having this vision of like down the road, OK, I'm going to be a songwriter. I'm going to get a deal with like Sony ATV, 
you know, and they'll give me like a, you know, million dollar advance and I'll buy a home in the Hollywood Hills and I'll be set for life, you know, and I'll work with Taylor Swift and this and that and the other thing. It's like, okay, no, you know, first of all, you don't write songs like that. So that none of that's going to happen. What do you really want to do with this? Because there's a way to do it and to make a living off it, to actually survive off it. You're not going to necessarily make a ton of money, but you'll be able to survive if you do everything that's that that you that you feel in here. If you listen to this, you know, stop using that. Stop, you know, you know, having these like crazy outlandish plans that won't go anywhere. Although in the case of some people, maybe they will. You know, you can't like this is not going to be a blanket thing for everybody. But you have to listen to this. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Beatles have written some of the greatest music in Christendom. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. You know. Their music is some of the most emotional, powerful music ever made by 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 Western Westerners, and um, it's indisputable that they communicate beautifully. And those guys were hardcore businessmen. I mean, they didn't they were not fucking around. I mean, they got jerked around a lot, sure. you know, business wise. Mm-hmm. But they were there to make money. They wanted to make money. They were right. and they were serious about it. But when it, when they went into the studio, they knew what their job was. Right. And they and they'd spend. McCartney, I think in particular, would spend weeks experimenting on stuff. Right. You know, you have to be prepared to push the mm-hmm. boundaries, mm. to listen to what your heart says. I mean, if your heart says go right and you start going right, and it says, nope, go left. You got to you, you just you got to roll with that, yeah. you know, and see where it takes you, you know, and trust that this isn't going to lead you astray. You know, you have to trust. We're at a point right now in our history where it doesn't matter anymore. The idea of making a million dollars in the music business is outrageously stupid. Mm-hmm. If that's your goal, I wish you the best of luck. I truly do. But I think it's really a dumb goal to have. It yeah. doesn't make sense. The best th- thing that you can do is just acknowledge the fact that you're warped, you're weird, you're not like anyone else, you're very special. <laughs> And you deserve and you deserve to treat yourself that way and respect the gifts that you are given mm-hmm. and just hunker down and make the most amu- amazing, wonderful, expressive music that you can possibly make, mm-hmm. you know, and, and put yourself in it completely. You know, that's for an artist. As far as the business, the business is fucked. It's it's so done right. in my mind. Right. They the, the perspective is completely wrong. They're basically trying to get their asses out of there. And but at the same time, make as much money as they possibly can in the process while diversifying over to other interests that aren't necessarily mu- based in music. Right. Excuse me. I, I think physical music, as we know, as a standalone, may not it may not last. Um, or you think it's become a part unless, of a product instead, like with an iPhone or whatever or. Oh, it it already is. Sure, it already yeah. is. Sure. You know, but the problem is, is that no one's coming along to make music that's powerful enough that it can actually be that it can actually exist on its own. Right. With a Beatles song, you don't need a video. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there aren't any videos, so what difference does it make? I'm sure if some enterprising soul could find like any kind of video, they'd attach it to a Beatles song, and maybe someone would make more money. Mm-hmm. But as it stands right now, that ain't going to happen. You know, yeah. the Beatles songs stand on their own and they're still making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. Those guys, the, all two of them that are left yeah. and the estates of the other two, they'll, they'll, they will be rich into perpetuity. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. I mean, it, it's, ama- it's amazing, great, timeless music. It lasts. Mm-hmm. They listened, to, they, they, they listened to, to this. They followed this, you know. Yeah. As far as the as far as the business goes, my feeling is that the business does not exist to um, it. It doesn't really exist to support art or artists. And an ideal scenario would be to completely rebuild it from the top, from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. I mean, because I remember, because I used to be in bands and stuff myself, and I never, I never wanted to get signed because, like you said, it's a well. First of all. All the risk is on the artist. The, the, it's like a really bad bank loan, essentially. It that, is. That you're not going to pay right. back, I guess. Um, oh, you'll pay it back. Right. <laughs> you, you know, as, as if you're, even if your record doesn't recoup, according to them, you will have paid it back many times if you're able to sell copies. Right. You know, I mean, I, I estimate that 
records that I've done just based on the price of a CD hmm. have, you know, have, have paid for large portions of, you know, uh, of record company buildings, right. you know, I mean, a, a record that's, that sells a million, that sells 3 million copies is going to generate roughly, you know, $30 million in revenue. Hmm. It's an ass load of money. Do you know how much it costs to make that record? Probably about like between five hundred and a million dollars, let's say. I mean, that's and it's a really, really expensive record, yeah, right yeah. there. You know, but I'm speaking from personal experience. Mm -hmm. A record, you know, here's a, let's all right, four million. So it generated forty million dollars, and it made, and, and it cost eight hundred. The record cost eight hundred fifty thousand dollars to make. Right. You know. But it takes the record company, according to them, about a year or two to recoup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who are they paying? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's not me. It's not the. It's not the band. They're not making the money off it. Mm. You know, the record company are making the lion's share of that. Exactly. You know, if I get, if if I get two million dollars, let's say, over the life of that span of that record, out of the forty that was generated. Not even that much, probably like a million and a half, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Right. Um, over the you know span of the record, the, you know the, the record, the band are probably making more than that. Mm. Who get who gets that? There's like I you know you can estimate that there's probably like thirty five million dollars worth of profit right there. Yeah, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, exactly. They did shit. They just gave us money to make the record, yeah. and they put. They excuse me. They put the artist into an onerous deal, mm. where the artist basically doesn't get anything out of it other than having their records promoted, which record companies these days, let's face it, do very very badly mm -hmm. because they don't even understand the markets anymore, and they can't be arsed to find out. Um, you know, it, it's it's a bad deal all the way around. So yeah, you were right not to get into a deal with a you know with mm -hmm. with a record company, you know. The business isn't, it, it, it's a bad model. It, do, it only generates money for the record companies. Exactly. It generates, yeah, it, it generates minimal amounts of money for everyone else compared to what their contribution was. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, it seems like the rich gets richer. That's a, in the music industry, that's a perfect example. That's how it works, it seems like. Oh, yeah. They're the, they're, they're you know, they, it's, a, it's a very capitalist model. Yeah. It's based uh yeah, it's it's basically our our wealth is built on your uh, on your um your on top of your effort and striving and sweat. Mm -hmm. You know. And it you know, and the and artists don't benefit. I mean, there there's no equity in this anywhere. Right. You know, but that's that's why record companies want to have their nice offices on Colorado Boulevard and you know, Santa Monica and stuff. You know, great big offices where they have like thousands of employees that basically they, they, you know they don't even know why they're paying them right yeah <laughs> exactly. and they have they have fuck all to do with actual with the with the actual records they've made right you know i mean <laughs> how has how the obviously because you've been in the industry for quite some time now how has that affected how you do work these days you know your view of the music industry or Yeah, absolutely it has. Right. Um, I have opted not to, I, I really don't work, I, I really don't produce physically in studios anymore. Right. Um, I, I found that over time there was a gradual bias against rock music. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's kind of a chicken before the egg type thing. I think what's happened is that people have progressively made shittier rock records. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They've gotten worse and worse. They don't have the kind of bite they used to have and they don't sell as well. So rock is considered to be kind of like a, you know, kind of a lesser um, form in the, uh, you know, in the constellation of, uh, you know, of popular music. Mm. Um, and that's honestly, that's where the bias was formed, because executives saw that rock was sort of like was not leading the pack anymore, that it had kind of like been eclipsed by hip hop, by pop music, even by country. And they're like, well, we don't have to devote resources to it anymore. Um, Unless you make a band like Metallica, Red Hot, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's interesting, too, though, because like there was also a mindset where people 
that people started having around the early 2000s where they were saying it's rock music we don't need to spend a lot of money making these records anyway so it was kind of like right, those right. two strains of thought were kind of concurrent with one another hmm. you know at, at any rate there aren't resources there to make rock records anymore which of course means that the yield is going to be pretty crappy uh, and it's the kind of and, and it's a, the the kind of genre that you do need resources for, you know, because there's musicians, mm -hmm. instruments. You need a room to record it in. You can't plug everything in, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, I guess if you wanted to really cut corners, you probably could, but uh, yeah, you know, it's it, it's it that's not going to make a better rock record for sure. Um, but it's it, you know, it, it it's been a it's been a self fulfilling self-defeating pro uh, prophecy at this point you know where you know where, where that type of music just doesn't really it doesn't resonate with people so yeah i mean what 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 i find really funny now is that i've i've actually worked with record companies or i've spoken to people at record companies who are talking about now i, I mean i i think maybe this is even eclipsed but like two years ago, they were all saying rock is going to come back with a vengeance, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. And we're going to be there and this and that and the other thing. And it's like, no, you, no, it's not. Right. No, you're not. Yeah. Because you don't even know how to make a rock record. You don't understand sure. all the things that go into doing something like that. You don't know how to set it up. You think that making a rock record is like sending the Beatles into a recording studio and they're going to kick it out at you in one day. It's like, no, mm -hmm. um, I won't. I, I I won't get involved in that. Like, but what does it take to make a great rock record? Obviously, you have done a few awesome ones. Uh, yeah, what what do you think it takes to actually make a really great... resources? Right, right. You need resources. You need all the resources you can get. The resources include great songwriting, great performing. Hmm. You know, someone like myself to put it to help organize it properly. Hmm. Great engineer to be able to record it. A great studio to work in great equipment, you know, having all these things. And if you're missing some of that, you just make do. But you also need prep work. You also need to understand how to set a record up. You have to understand how much how much time it's going to take for the artist to prepare their music hmm. before they even walk into the recording studio. And that's something that nobody does now. Right. Nobody. What does that um, mean like, for them to prepare? Pre-production. Right, right. Pre-production. Spending time, usually months. In some, I've done records where pre-production lasted seven months. Right. You know, that's a long time. That's 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 as long as like four records now. Yeah. You know, yeah, five yeah. people could do. People could actually do ten records in like seven months at this rate. Right. You know, in the time that it took me to do pre-production on this one record, you know, like this is where my this is uh, this is why I've had to completely reorient reorient how I work. Right. Excuse me, because I don't want to. Because I don't want to waste my time anymore making records if there isn't a foundation for them to for a record to to sit on. Mm -hmm. If someone's going to send me into a studio and say, "Okay, here's a bunch of money. You've got three and a half weeks to make a record. That's it. You know, after that you're done. Mixed, done, dusted." I'll say no. Right. <laughs> I'll say I'm not doing it. You know, you need someone else for this. That's not the work that I do. That's not my job. You've mistaken me for another individual. Right. You know, what I'm going to do with an artist is I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to help them hone their music. I'm also going to give them the opportunity to see from a hold it from a different perspective what their music actually looks like, where the problems are, what issues are systemic in their songwriting, mm -hmm. you know, what they need to fix, what they need to focus on. If you're not willing to offer all that in a in a, in a, in a recording, then you're not doing your job, as right. far as I'm concerned. If if you call yourself a record producer, right, that makes total sense to be honest. Um, but something I'm very curious to hear is um, what you just said. What what you do in pre-production? Could you give us an example of where you might, or how, or actually how you find the issues in in songs? Is there something yeah. particular you look for, or how <laughs> do you do it? Well. I you basically start by using this. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's, these are your tools, you know. But I've trained myself over time to listen to music and be aware of where I'm, where I'm not paying attention to it anymore. Right. 
where something else gets my attention. Usually what that means is that there's a disconnect in the song, that I'm being diverted because something in the song isn't working. Then it's my job to go back and listen to it as many times as I can to figure out what that something is. And then from there, figure out how to fix. Right. It's a, it's really as simple as that, mm-hmm. you know, and it's sa- and it sounds simple, but for anyone who doesn't understand what about record production, it's incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. You could sit there for hours. At the same time, every human being who loves music is going to be aware that something's wrong, mm-hmm. and that's where it's interesting. Because while all human beings can't be producers, we all have the same kind of instincts and we also respond to music in the same way. And if there's an issue in the arrangement, the structure or the orchestration, it's going to hit you Mm -hmm. and you're going to be aware of it. You're not going to know what it is. You won't know how to fix it, but you'll know. And that is one reason why a good a good song can become absolute can become absolute crap because of how it was arranged or how it was structured or orchestrated. And obviously, that's what we work on when we're in pre-production. What's in the way here? Is there a bass drum beat that's not supporting the vocal on this particular beat? Mm-hmm. You know, what do we got to move around? How do we fix this? It's right. stuff like that. It's basically getting under the hood and doing really forensic work mm-hmm. on someone else's music. Right. Yeah, that, that's super interesting, man. Uh, and it makes complete sense to do it that way. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, but do you think then going back to what we said before, like uh, to say the kids today thing, do you think is music today doing that job well enough? Because there is, so to speak, less attention to try to grab hold of, or there's so much else taking your attention. Um, well, it depends what we're talking about. I mean, with pop music, I think all of it, when I listen to it, I just, I just go, there isn't anything wrong with it. Right. You know, structurally, it all seems to work fine. There's no, there's nothing in it that's causing me not to pay attention to the vocal, which is, of course, is the main, that's the primary point of focus, as it should be in Mm -hmm. any music where there is a vocal. So the instruments generally aren't interfering. And since it's, you know, it's obvious that, that, you know, this song is successful because it's, everything's doing its job. Is it resonating with me emotionally? Mm-hmm. Probably not, you know, because it doesn't have that kind of intrinsic, I mean to tell you this, this is what I want to share with you. I'm trying to convey this feeling, thought or emotion or, or, or mood right. your, your way. It doesn't have that, you know, I mean, it, it's about some, I mean, it's not even, it doesn't even have to do with the narrative, although that's, you know, that's a, that's a, 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 a key or, or, or a, um, a hint. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it really comes down to what the people who are making the music are really trying to do, what their intent is, what they're thinking about while they're doing it, or if they're looking at their phones the entire time, right. you know, and really weren't invested emotionally in it. Hmm. Um, I, I, you know, when I, I, I do try to listen to music that people release now. Um, it's. You know, I mean, I, I, I recognize it has value. I mean, people have been making like have been making pop music like this for, you know, of that sort, just kind of bubblegummy type stuff, mm-hmm. you know, for like, what, 70 years. Sure. I mean, since the since the 50s, really, like that's where bubblegummy stuff really came from. And that's basically what the radio saturated with now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's. It serves a purpose. The problem is, is that when you have a music, um, a universe of music that's completely saturated with that kind of music, and that's basically the position from which all other music extrapolates, then you got a problem. You know, I mean, as far as any other form of music that requires pre-production, that would require pre-production, it's generally rock music. Mm. And most of what I listen to now that I've heard that's recent is it's so bad, actually, that it, it kind of it, it, it I get physically like it, it physically hurts me to listen to it. Right. I mean, people make terrible decisions on every level. They make bad decisions about what kind of drum beats they use, about what the rhythm section is doing, you know, about where they put guitar parts, about what the you know, what, how the singer's treating the song, you know, you know, sonic choices. The list is endless. 
Right. I mean, you do you know, think it's a generation generational uh, issue or no, no? I I don't think it's generational. Right. I think that I think the issue really comes down to the fact that people don't have at this particular stage in our collective history a contemporary model of of, of how to do it right. There are no right. contemporary models. Right. What there are are models in the past, you know, which people have gone back to time and again. And you at this point, I don't think anyone wants to hear someone re, you know, recycle the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin for the eighth time. <laughs> it's too much. It's yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's what that's what you got. Those are the reference points that people use. They're not contemporary. They're ancient. This is all music, and I include the Beatles in this. This is all music that we should not be listening to anymore. Mm. You know, I mean, after Bach died, no one gave a shit about him. Right. You know, I mean, you discover you're supposed to discover these people like hundreds of years later. Mm. I would be much happier right now if we lived in a world where people care, where people treated Beatle, the Beatles the way I used to look at doo wop music when I was a teenager. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> doo wop music was like. I shunned it. It was disgusting to me. Like when I heard it on the radio, I'd run to turn it off because I couldn't say it was like old, old folks music. Like who listens to that shit? Right, right. You know, <laughs> but now you have like, you've got like, I mean, I'm playing the Beatles for my two year old son. Hmm. Like I shouldn't have to do that. There should be music right, out there right, that's right. viable, mm -hmm. that has the same, that has that kind of impact, that kind of emotional power where I don't have to like go to the Beatles as a reference point, you know, and be like, Oh, those guys Pff, yeah. old. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that would be the dream, to be honest, if that was the case. Uh, it is. Yeah. It is the dream. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there, there are many factors involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, why why this is the case. It, this is actually really funny because I had a um, I have a fr I, I know someone on Facebook who um, is is dating Keith Richards. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And. <laughs> She posted something that Keith he can't under he can't seem to understand why the he and the Beatles you know the Stones and the Beatles were sort of like at the, they kind of like hit the pinnacle and after that it was all like shh, from there and I basically laid it out for him I wrote him a long e like a, a a long message on Facebook and I was like it's because of this 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 and this it's <laughs> cultural and blah 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 and sociological and they were both like. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't know what to say. They're like, whoa. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's true. I mean, people really they wonder about this, but it's like uh, there's so many fa there's many factors, but it's easy to explain. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem here is that people have fallen too far into this whole concept of music as a commodity. Right. They've they've moved too far away from music as an art form because no one likes the term art. Because it's too highbrow and right. it means something that like you can't get your head around. It's like, no, 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 no. Art is meant to be a personal expression. Mm -hmm. If you go into a museum and you look at an abstract painting where someone threw paint on it, you know, in some case, a lot of people aren't going to be able to get that, mm -hmm. you know. However, you know, I mean, of, co of course, if you go into an art museum and you look at a Jackson Pollock, you know, like. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who don't like his work. Sure. But if I stand in front of one of those, I, I can't tell you how many emotions I have. Right. It's, it's incredibly powerful. And you don't even know why. It's like, wait, they're just, just like brush marks across the canvas. Why do I feel like this? What the hell is going on? Hmm. It's because the guy was standing over this canvas and he was experiencing all this shit while it was happening. You're basically picking up in real time what he was putting down while he was making this. Mm -hmm. That's what art is. And right. people have forgotten it. They see it as a commodity. It is a commodity, but it's not exclusively a commodity. You have to be able to sell it in a capitalist society so the people who create it are able to profit off it so they can live and feed their families and stuff. Exactly, yeah. You know, but when it becomes a, a purely capitalist enterprise, then you're moving into different territory with it. And like the people who come along and gentrify the neighborhood, mm. you know, to get so that all the, you know, the, all the people, the, the rich people can kick all the, you know, the cool people out. It loses what's intrinsic to it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there was um, one thing Frank Zappa said. I, I can't remember exactly, but he was also really passionate about this back in the 70s, I guess, 80s, whatever. Uh, and I, th I think he said something like the record fo folks back then they didn't know 
what would stick. You know, there was no, there was no, no commodity of music. They just tried, it. like, oh, let's try it. And you know, there was good music coming out, and he was sort of, um, you know, uh, giving that to the record men, not knowing, to, you know, not knowing basically what would stick and what wouldn't work or not. Like today, where they tried to yeah. have all the research, they tried to you know, find the correct audience. They didn't have that back then. Uh, well, that was his take back in the 70s, but I yeah, think well, it he rings, was spot, rings true, yeah. He was spot on. It, well, it does ring true because people are basically using data mm -hmm. to figure out how to make music now. They're basically figuring out what audience to direct a particular type of music that hasn't yet been created to, right. you know? And again, that, that works completely in opposition, diametric opposition, to the concept of what art is. How can art be a personal expression that comes from an individual to, you know, to, that's meant to communicate with another individual if it's being made based on data that you're getting about large groups of people? It doesn't compute. Mm. It makes no sense at all. And again, it goes against the purpose of art. It goes against what art is supposed to do as a communicative medium, as a communication medium. Yeah, totally, man. I mean, it's a fascinating topic because Obviously, we, we both hope it's going to fix itself somehow, but... It's not going to fix itself. Right. <laughs> it's not going to fix itself. There's, it's impossible to fix itself because art is made by people. Art right. isn't an entity that just kind of like exists in the ether. You know, if art's going to get fixed, people are going to fix it because it's people's expression. Mm -hmm. It's what we do with it that matters. It's, right. our, it's our ability or lack of ability to take responsibility for what our artistic expression is in the world that ultimately determines whether or not it has viability, whether or not it's going to matter to someone in the long term. Hmm. You know, if your intent with something is to make a piece of work that will sustain and you have the resources and you have the capability, you will succeed. Right. That is an inalienable fact. And I know this because that is the tenet on which I've, I've done every pr record I've, I've produced, right. you know, the ones where I, where I knew I had the resources, where I knew I had the talent mm -hmm. at my dis disposal, mm -hmm. and I was able to work the way I wanted to work, every time it's going to work. Right. It's simple. That part of it's simple. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the hard work part of it is where it gets complicated because you don't know what, what direction it's going to head in. Right. You know, but believe it, man. I mean, when I went in to make records like Super Unknown or Mechanical Animals, I had a very clear sense of what I was working with and what I was going to do with it. Hmm. You can't not. Right. You know, if you have that, you're going to succeed. It's mm -hmm. impossible not to. You basically stack the deck in your favor every possible way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I might be wrong at this, but do you think that people, since, we, since we're able to release our own music these days through whatever platform online, do you think that has made it worse? Or was it good when there was labels who could vet the music to some degree like back in the day uh, i think having the vetting process was is is good i think that making i do feel that um democratizing uh music production has in some way had a detrimental effect on how people work um but i really think I really feel that the that the that the greatest issue is with the quality of what's out there now that people are able to use as a benchmark or a reference point. Mm. You know, I suppose that the, with the advent of technology, the de democratization of music technology, uh, and the ability to create a, a whole record in your in your bedroom, that that it, it had to come. I mean, we were seeing it toward the end of the '90s as well. Right. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, I mean, you know, Les Paul was essentially a bedroom engineer. I mean, all his records were done in like apartments in, throughout Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he revolutionized recording, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but again, the responsibility, I think, for this is not, it doesn't fall on the part, on, on, be, on the companies that right. put it out. Right. You know. That we, we know that they're corrupt. We right. know that, they, that they're a network that is designed to, to serve itself. They, they are not interested in music creation. 
and they're not interested in music innovation. It doesn't it doesn't suit their business model. It doesn't serve their business model. It's not going to make them more money. Actually, it will. It would if they actually devoted their efforts to um, improving the lots of artists and making and providing more resources for them to make records. But they don't see it like that because their business now has turned into a short term one instead of a long term one. Their goals are different. Wow. They're looking to make as much money as they can in the short term as possible. They're not looking in terms of you know down the road. Will can this per- can I have a career mm. with this person? Mm. They're like, I just want to squeeze as much juice as I can out of this, and I don't care what happens after yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're seeing across a lot of businesses these days, like the tech companies who, to some oh, yeah. degree, run the music industry. Unfortunately, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I feel the passion for it, and I agree with you, and I, I hope it's going to change for the better. Um, it's up to us. Yeah. It's up to each individual person to make a difference. I mean, granted, it would be better if there was a guild or something like that, if, if artists actually were able to get together. I mean, that's a dream of mine mm. to have like a to have an artist guild, you know, for for musicians to basically insulate them against it, against everyone that would potentially pilfer what they're doing or take advantage of them or put them out there before it's their time. That's one of the things that really destroyed a lot of great talent in the late 90s, early 2000s. And even going further forward than that, uh, you know, was this need for record companies to sign as many artists as they could Hmm. and to get into bidding wars over artists that really were untried um, just because they kind of they either were speculating on them Mm -hmm. or they actually wanted to take them off the table so no one else would have success with them in case that happened. Uh, yeah. It's a pretty scary way to do business. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean that's that's the mentality that fuels it, and that's also part of what has helped destroy rock music to a great extent because those were the kinds of deals that I was watching people make. Right. Yeah. You know, and I saw there's a lot of talented people out there who are still scratching their heads, going like, "Why wasn't I more successful?" It's like right. you weren't even given a chance to be successful. Right. You know, they pulled you off the table, gave you 600 grand to do three records. You know, you made one record, blew your entire advance, and the record company canned your record and dropped you. That's yeah. what happened. Yeah. You know, I've seen that story play out many times. Yeah, I mean, that must be awful, to be honest. Um, really awful for the band or artist. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's crushing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's... It, it's the kind of thing that can dr- that can basically that, that can push someone into a serious depression. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and and basically haunt them for the rest of their lives, you know. Because as an artist, you're also very sensitive. I mean, you know, when you've realized that you've been through something like that, and you got absolutely nothing out of the deal at all, you, you're like the bitterness is like incredible. I mean, I I know a lot of people who just left. Because they had that experience and just couldn't deal with it a second time. I can imagine, man. I mean, especially when you put yourself out there, you know, your whole heart out there, to be honest. And something like that happens. Yeah, it must be terrible, uh, for sure. It is. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, is there uh, any band or artist these days that you do see, uh, not potential, that's the word I want to use, but... Is there any band or artist that tickles your your brain these days, so to speak? <laughs> not specifically, no. I mean, I'm not really inspired by anyone who's contemporary. There's a lot of but. stuff that I listen to where I go, okay, that's cool. Mm. Um, the thing that that strikes me the most is that the world and the world of music creation is full of unbelievably talented people. Mm-hmm. And it's heartbreaking to recognize that out of out of all these people, you're not finding one person who's basically our Mozart right. or our Beethoven. There's not one, right. you know, and I'm, and, it, it, and I'm not talking in terms of record sales at this sure. point. I'm just talking in terms of someone who can galvanize the entire musical community where everyone goes wow that guy's doing something or that won't, she's doing something. Isn't the, you know, can you say Billy Eilish? Did something like that, or or Eilish? Is it Eilish? Eilish? Well, you could, but I wouldn't. But <laughs> um, 
No, I, I think that Billie Eilish is very talented. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously her, hu her husband, <laughs> her yeah, brother, brother yeah. is very talented as well. They're, they're incredibly talented, you know, but Mozart? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not that level. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> you know, I mean, have you ever, like, Mozart, even in his time, Mozart was one of the most respected composers. Right. When he lived, like, he, the, his last opera was, oh, I can't remember it now. Holy mackerel. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. It's not the magic flute. No, it's, um, fuck. I couldn't, I couldn't help you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. His last opera, um, I think he died like Is about that the a film? month or Was two that the after. film is about or the film no, that came no. out in the 90s? No. That film's a crock of shit. It's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's. It's it's basically a fictionalized impression of of you know how he died and stuff, and it's got mm -hmm. it, it, it's no basis in reality at all. Right. Um, he this opera, whatever it was, yeah. Um, it it ran it ran in Vienna for ten years. It didn't stop. Every night it was like the the right. the place where it was the the theater where it was performing was full of people. Right. Ten years it ran. You know, when his, I, I remember reading something that like a reviewer said about, um, a, about a, an opera that they saw of his, you know, the night, like the, the premiere night, they said something like, we have never seen such genius. Right. But do you think as a, as a, as a society and uh, as, as, as human beings on this planet that we can expect? A Mozart to come up every century, or maybe Beatles were our Mozart, so to speak. We have to wait another hundred years. Let me put it to you like this: Right, Mozart and Beethoven are two of the best known composers of the symphonic era. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say the time, the the passage of time from when I think Mozart died in seventeen ninety three. And Beethoven was composing his most important works around 189 or something like that. So you're talking about less than 10. You're talking about like 10, 20 years between them. Mm -hmm. Expect? No. Demand. <laughs> insist. <Yeah. laughs> you know, there's no accounting for any of this. But the fact that we've hit such a log jam mm -hmm. and everyone's like, you know, I mean... There's a passage of time between Bach and um, Mozart where there are tons of great composers. You know, I think Purcell was after um, Bach or um, High um, Handel. Right. I think was after Bach. You know, I mean, there and obviously they're they're still in the same time period. But the thing is, is that there were tons of people who were doing this. You know. And then between Beethoven and, I don't know, Mendelssohn, Wagner, you know, guys like those. And then from the, those guys to like, um, oh, and Chopin, you know, and then those guys to like Debussy, Debussy and, um, and Tchaikovsky. I mean, right. that's all in the span of one century. Right. That's all in the span of one fucking century. You have so many composers in the 19th century alone. This is like, uh, these are periods of tremendous innovation. Right. There's no excuse. I mean, the 20th century may be the most prolific period for music composition in general, because, you know, you can, like the, the, the number, the, the quantity of music that was created and the number of geniuses who were making music, you know, throughout the 20th century, it's, I, I can't even get my head around. Mm -hmm. And it absolutely, it's, it's, it 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 dwarfs the amount of people who are composing music in the in the eighteenth in the nineteenth century. Right, right. You know, but all of a sudden there's this like, yeah, it just stops. Why did it stop? You right. know, well, <laughs> you know, music became something other than what it was. Mm. These people were making music that communicated, that meant something, that said something. You know, there's so many eras of music in the 20th century. You know, 
I mean, you have different eras of modern classical music, and you've got the development of modern popular music, which started, you know, in America in the mid in the mid nineteenth century, and it just kind of developed over time. And there's so many American musical forms. I mean, come on, you know, you've got blues, you've got this, you've got that. I mean, when you start looking at the picture mm -hmm. of what this path looks like, there's no excuse for people to just kind of go like, yeah, it's good enough. You know, right. and that's fine. You right. know, I mean, come on. You think Muddy Waters is saying that? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Howlin' Wolf? I mean, these yeah. guys, like, tore it up. Exactly. You know, Muddy Waters would write a song on the spot and perform it, and now we're listening to it. You were still listening to it, like, 70, 80 years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's that about? Come on. Music is, like, 70 years old. You can put it on and go, wow, mm -hmm. wow, wow. Exactly. You know? What about Little Richard? I mean, he just died. My son listens to Little Richard. He loves that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it's still exciting, vibrant music that mm -hmm. gets in your soul. And it doesn't, there's a piano in it, there's saxophones in it, it sounds dated. It doesn't matter. No, it it's doesn't still matter, no. got something. It hits you. Yeah. You know, it hits you. And that is traction. That's traction. You're not experiencing that from music now. No. And this, and, and that's why. I mean, I, I feel you, man. And I, yeah. Uh, I, I completely we can agree. expect that. We can expect it and demand it and yeah. insist on it. I think, that, I think that's a good, good uh, motto for people to bring with them. You know, that we demand that level of quality, I guess. Well, you know, it's up to an audience. But the problem mm -hmm. is, is that audiences are being, are, have been turned into consumers. Right. And consumers, they accept what they get. Right. That's the way people who right. who run a capitalist society want it. Mm -hmm. They'll make you a consumer. You'll buy what we give you. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll give it. We'll give you what we're going to give you when it's time to give you when it's mm -hmm. time to give it to you. That's what music's been turned into. It's been commodified in the same exact way. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to give you something that's safe, something we know you're going to buy, mm -hmm. and something that you will come back for and buy again in the same way. Because we want to make sure our numbers are stable yeah. and that we are able to get get a handle on what our product is. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, man. Uh, big shame. Uh, yeah. It is what it is. It's Again, it's a challenge for the artistic community to come up with an alternative. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's a mighty challenge. Yeah. It's a good challenge. It's a good challenge. I think uh, people should be encouraged by it rather than... I am. Yeah. I think it's I think it's I think it's positive because ultimately what this is going to do, if it's handled by creative people the right way and if they can get their heads out of their asses long enough to do it, it gives it's going to give them autonomy, full autonomy, because the business structure has already been created by people who understand business. Artists can take that over now. They can co-opt that. They can use it for their own needs, mm -hmm. create their own business. They can create their own bulwark against capitalists mm -hmm. who are going to try who are, who are going to take advantage of their work i mean if i want to exploit your work as an artist i need to give you something in return that's going to make the relationship fair mm -hmm. it's going to make it symbiotic i mean i love exploiting artists yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure it's made me an immense amount of money exploiting artists but i gave them something in return they exploited me this is symbiosis mm -hmm. we used one another because and, and we worked for one another. We did for we performed a function for one another. I have been exploited similarly. But the thing is is that I I I am I was willing and I am willing to sign on to something that I believe in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I believe in your art, you know, I I will I will be more than happy to be exploited by you. You know? Yeah. Obviously exactly. you're gonna pay you're gonna pay me for the privilege. But we're going to get something out of it. We're going to get something big out of it. We're going to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. We're going to work together. And we're going to create like this whole new consciousness that never existed before. Who wouldn't want to be involved in something like that who's in the arts? Exactly, man. I, I, I completely agree. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It is. Um, and I hope people, yeah, like, like I said, people should be encouraged by this rather than thinking, oh, shit, there's a lot to do. But there is a lot to do. But there is a lot to do. Yeah. It is a lot to do. It's gonna take time, you but know. Should... But that's what life is about. Life is life involves life involves um, effort. Yeah. It involves striving. You know, it it involves. And if you have something to strive for, something that you believe in, 
that's part of what gives life purpose. You know, exactly. you can choose to sit here and just kind of wait for the end to come or you can get your ass out there and do something, you know, and really kind of put yourself into a cause, you know, something that has meaning, something that, you know, is also going to benefit other people. Mm-hmm. You know, music, music touches people. It's meant it's meant to affect people emotionally. It's meant to give them something to share things with them. If you're putting yourself into improving that, what could be what could be higher? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well put. <laughs> um, it's better than religion. Yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, religion is yeah more confusing than anything else, I guess. Um, yeah, but it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a, it's just a system of control. That's all. Right. Um, I, I I like to just shift focus before we wrap up. Um, and that is, it's going to be a random jump where we are in this in this podcast now, but that's fine. Because <laughs> um, something I'm, I'm really fascinating about is for people I look up to, like yourself and other people in the industry, is there always seems to be this moment where they were either going to continue doing what they were doing uh, despite it being really hard or they're going to quit, right? And I know you had a moment, for example, before the Uplift Mofa Party plan, right? Like where it was a struggle, but you decided to keep going and, well, the rest is history, I guess, right? You mean on that particular project? Or just before that project where you were out of work for a long time and it seemed to be... No. No? I was, no, it was tough. Um, And I was, yeah, I mean, I was basically trying to just make, have as many meetings with A&R people uh, as I possibly could. And I was also like painfully shy. So that didn't make things easy. (laughs) Oh, you were shy then. You're not shy now. (laughs) Um, I don't think so. Uh, But I was back then. I mean, I couldn't even talk to people. It was really funny, actually. Wow. You know, so it's like, please give me some work. (laughs) <laughs> or something oh, yeah. like that <laughs> I, kind of not really but wow, um right. i you know like i i think i was very depressed back then but i don't think i was ever ready to give up right okay, you know it was just my interpretation of it i think as far as giving up um <laughs> the only anecdote that i can provide you with was there was a point in my life where um my father was an accountant and like he went to accountancy school and stuff like that. And he was very disappointed that I'd gone into the arts. Right. Um, and I remember um, I was living with this girl whose dad was like really down on artists. And he also didn't know we were living together. Uh, <laughs> and, but, you know, I'd, I'd see him and he'd just, you know, he'd just rail about arts, artists and, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I just, I was getting so much pressure and I was like 21 years old or something like that. Yeah. And I just made this decision. I was like, you know what? I'm giving this up. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to accountancy school and I'm just going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to get a real job. I'm going to do, you know, have a real, you know, life and forget this art bullshit because it's not going to take me anywhere Hmm. and i told my girlfriend about it and she was like oh yeah you know and i told my dad about it i think i'd never heard him so happy in my life wow and then i ran into an old girlfriend that night and i went home with her and (laughs) and the next day i called my dad up and i was like you remember i told you about going to accountancy school and he's like yeah and i said fuck it it ain't gonna happen That's good. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, what what made you change your mind that night? Was it the girl in particular, or <laughs> it was a circumstance? Right, right. I mean, running into this girl, going back with her to her house, and you know, doing what people at that sure. age do. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and just kind of, and the 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 thrill and excitement of that was a real trigger for me, and I just sort of started to look. At what I was, what I was contriving to do, what I was planning to do, impulsively too, to go into this kind of like structured world that had nothing to offer me and had absolutely nothing to do with me whatsoever. And I was like, wait a second, I'm just giving in to like all this pressure from around me when really that's not who I am at all. I'm 
I'm a completely different person and I have to follow that road. So that's where I'm going. Come hell or high water, I don't care. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's that's very good, man. Because obviously, there is ups ups and downs being in the music industry. Like everyone knows, I guess. Um, so yeah, that that's always fascinating me, though, when people calmly, or maybe not calmly, but that they just ride the wave, you know, and they take it as it comes. That's it's it's a yeah, it's a good once you quality. accept once you once you accept that this is going to be your lot in life and this is how it is mm. you'll be happier <laughs> you're 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 better off you're better off rolling with yeah with whatever exactly excuse me comes to you you know you're better off just kind of dealing with it and going like okay you know this is part this is part of the experience it's not this is it's not like this is my punishment for choosing a, for making a bad career choice it's like no this is part of being alive mm. this is part of the career choice that i made and this is the right way to go you know, people may be turning me down now, but something else is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Nothing stays the same forever. Yeah. There's a constant, as you said, you know, things ch- things shift and change constantly. Mm. You know, we're all part of like this great big, you know, matrix of events and, you know, of situations and occurrences in life. And you can fight it all you want, but in the end, it's best just to ride with it and go, okay, you know, what do I and maximize it? Take advantage of the resources at your hands. Mm-hmm. You know, what do I do to maximize this? What do I do to make it better? You know, if I'm struggling right now, if I'm not, if I'm out of work, um, I guess I can learn to do something else that's connected to what I'm doing. I'm going to get better at music theory. I'm going to learn how to program this synthesizer. Mm-hmm. I'm going to learn how to play drums or you know trombone or something like that. You know, I'm going to reach out to my friends and see how they're how they're doing, you know, see if I can help them in some way, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. You just, you know, keep rolling with it and and not get bogged down in your own, you know, your your own personal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the tempest is all up here. It's not actually happening out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's well said. (laughs) Um, And I think you're completely right in in what you're saying. So that's great advice. well, Michael, it was a big, big pleasure talking to you. Um, actually, before we wrap up, maybe you can let the, the people listening, watching, uh, let them know where they can hire you or find more stuff about you, listen to your stuff, whatever you have going on. Well, uh, my new website, I think, is going to be up. I think it's up now, actually. Right. Uh, it's Yeah, I, I have an old one, michaelbeinhorn.com. Mm-hmm. My new website is beinhorncreative.com. Right. And it's essentially, it's it's for all the remote work that I do. Okay. Uh, I, this is, this is the most cost effective way, I think, to make records now. And it's a really, really positive, I guess, alternative to how people are working out there are not able to work out there because of, you know, the COVID virus and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to interact remotely is, uh, has been life changing, uh, for me and for a lot of people I've worked with. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of great projects in the pipeline. I've been working with, um, awesome. Rivers Cuomo from Re- from Weezer right, right, on yeah. his past couple of records. You know, we, we've got, we, we've been working like this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm remotely producing a bunch of other recordings as well with independent artists. Mm-hmm. And I can do this from anywhere in the world. It's incredible. Like, I don't need a recording studio. I'm completely mobile now. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. I, and my, I mean, I've got like really, really good quality listening equipment here. I've got a I've got a DAC and an up sampler and like and headphone systems that are actually that, that are more accurate than the control room uh, monitors that people are using in their studio. So I can hear stuff that they can't even hear. Right, right. Awesome. Over the internet. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So those are the best places to contact me. Cool. At uh, info, at, I mean, at, at Michael Bein, at BeinhornCreative.com. Cool. Yeah, I'll leave a link below so people can click it, obviously. Thank you. And Thank are you, you on the social media at all or... Yeah, I'm on Facebook, uh-huh. Instagram. I don't really post that much because... Uh, Sure, it's getting it's getting too crazy out there. <laughs> and, 
um i got a lot of work i, I have a i have a lot of stuff to do here so yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I'm, I'm reachable through there as well awesome man well i'll leave a link to everything so people can check you out uh, thanks, yeah, th- man. thanks again for coming on man it was it was a pleasure pleasure is mine awesome Thank you very much, Michael, for coming on to the show. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Again, please let me know in the comments if you have any questions, or let me know if you agree or disagree what was being said in the interview. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or Apple Podcast or Spotify. If you're listening to Apple Podcast, uh, please leave a rating. And a comment, let me know what you think about the show. This helps bring more guests on, more high-profile guests, and stuff like that. And also, don't forget to join the email list to get exclusive access to interviews before anyone else, or the public, as you say. Uh, and you get a chance to submit questions to up-and-coming guests. But that's it. It was awesome having you here this week as well. And I'll see you guys very soon.